Grace and peace to you on this Good Friday. Good Friday is a day of paradox. We call this day Good Friday because it is the day that the church reflects upon the death of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. It is a paradox because we call this day of our Lord's death good. The disciples did not look at it that way on that day. They did not think that day was good. That day, more than any other day, was a day of pain and suffering, not just for Jesus, but for his disciples who followed him and loved him. But we call it good, Good Friday. What makes this Good Friday? Well, of course, the answer is that the death of Jesus is the most important death in the history of the world. His death brings about the eventual resurrection on Easter. And this brings about the eternal message of hope that we have in the gospel. So our Good Friday service will be a reflection upon the death of Christ, a very serious and sober reflection as we draw into the story of that day when our Lord and Savior died. Let's begin with our call to worship. O oh Lord, open my lips and my mouth will declare your praise. Blessed be the name of the Lord our God, who redeems us from sin and death. Make haste, O God, to deliver me. Make haste, O Lord, to save me. Let us go to the Lord in prayer. Almighty God, Heavenly Father, we pray that you will graciously look upon us, your family, your sons and your daughters, for whom our Lord Jesus Christ was willing to be betrayed and given into the hands of sinners and to suffer death upon the cross. We thank you for that sacrifice. We thank you for that substitute in our place. And as we live our lives and descend into the cross ourselves, as we pick up our cross and follow the Lord Jesus Christ, we pray that you will give us the grace we need through the power of your Spirit to serve you, to love you, to serve others, and to let others know of the love of the Lord Jesus Christ. We pray this in the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Our call to confession for this Good Friday comes from from readings in the Gospel of John on the passion of our Lord Jesus Christ, beginning in John chapter 19. After we read a section of John chapter 19, we will also sing a verse of O Sacred Head Now Wounded. The verse will reflect upon the reading, and by reading the scripture and singing the verse, we will reflect upon the death of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ and then move into our time of confession. John chapter 19, verses 1 through 15. Then Pilate took Jesus and flogged him, and the soldiers twisted together a crown of thorns and put it on his head and arrayed him in a purple robe. They came up to him saying, Hell, king of the Jews, and struck him with their hands. Pilate went out again and said to them, See, I am bringing him out to you that you may know that I find no guilt in him. So Jesus came out wearing a crown of thorns and the purple robe. Pilate said to them, Behold the man. When the chief priests and the officers saw him, they cried out, Crucify him, crucify him. Pilate said to them, Take him yourselves and crucify him, for I find no guilt in him. The Jews answered him, We have a law, and according to that law he ought to die, because he has made himself the Son of God. When Pilate heard this statement, he was even more afraid. He entered his headquarters again and said to Jesus, Where are you from? Do you not know that I have authority to release you and authority to crucify you? Jesus answered him, You would have no authority over me at all unless it had been given you from above. Therefore, he who delivered me over to you has the greater sin. From then on, Pilate sought to release him. But the Jews cried out, If you release this man, you are not Caesar's friend. Everyone who makes himself a king opposes Caesar. So when Pilate heard these words... He brought Jesus out and sat him on the judgment seat at a place called the Stone Pavement, in Aramaic, Gabbatha. Now it was the day of preparation of the Passover. 
It was about the sixth hour. He said to the Jews, Behold your king. They cried out, Away with him! Away with him! Crucify him! Pilate said, Shall I crucify your king? The chief priests answered, We have no king but Caesar. So Pilate delivered him over to be crucified. And they took Jesus and went out, bearing his, and Jesus went out bearing his own cross to the place called the place of the skull, which in Aramaic is called Golgotha. There they crucified him, and with two others, one on either side, and Jesus in between them. Pilate also wrote an inscription and put it on the cross. It read, Jesus of Nazareth, King of the Jews. Many of the Jews read this inscription, for the place where Jesus was crucified was near the city, and it was written in Aramaic, in Latin, and in Greek. So the chief priests of the Jews said to Pilate, Do not write, The King of the Jews, but rather, This man said, I am King of the Jews. Pilate answered, What I have written, I have written. When the soldiers had crucified Jesus, they took his garments and divided them into four parts, one part for each soldier, also his tunic. But the tunic was seamless, woven in one piece from top to bottom. So they said to one another, Let us not tear it, but cast lots for to see whose it shall be. This was to fulfill the scripture which says, They divided my garments among them, and for my clothing they cast lots. So the soldiers did these things, but standing by the cross of Jesus were his mother and his mother's sister, Mary, the wife of Clopas, and Mary Magdalene. When Jesus saw his mother and the disciple whom he loved standing nearby, he said to his mother, Woman, behold your son. Then he said to his disciple, Behold your mother. And from that hour the disciple took her to his own home. After this, Jesus, knowing that all was now finished, said, to fulfill the scripture, I thirst. A jar full of sour wine stood there, so they put a sponge full of sour wine on a hyssop branch and held it to his mouth. When Jesus had received the sour wine, he said, It is finished. And he bowed his head and gave up his spirit. Since it was the day of preparation, and so that the bodies would not remain on the cross on the Sabbath, for the Sabbath was a high day, the Jews asked Pilate that their legs might be broken and that they might be taken away. So the soldiers came and broke the legs of the first and of the other who had been crucified with Jesus. But when they came to Jesus 
and saw that he was already dead, they did not break his legs. But one of the soldiers pierced his side with a spear, and at once there came out blood and water. He who saw it has borne witness. His testimony is true, and he knows that he is telling the truth, that you may also believe. For these things took place that the Scripture might be fulfilled. Not one of his bones will be broken. And again, another Scripture says, they will look on him whom they have pierced. After hearing the readings from the Gospel of John about the suffering and crucifixion of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, and singing in between the, the notion of how the sacred head of Christ was wounded, broken, and bruised, let us now take a moment to individually draw near to the throne of grace, confessing our sins unto the Lord, and then we will corporately confess our sins together. Let us pray. O Savior of the world, who by your cross and precious blood has redeemed us, save us and help us, we humbly ask you, O Lord. Forbid, O God, that we should forget, amid our earthly comforts, the pains and mortal anguish that our Lord Jesus endured for our salvation. Grant us this day a true vision of all that he suffered in his betrayal, his lonely agony, his false trial, his mocking and scourging, and the torture of death upon the cross. As you have graciously given yourself utterly for us, may we give ourselves entirely to you, O Jesus Christ, our only Lord and Savior. Amen. Our assurance of pardon comes from Isaiah 53, verse 5. The prophet Isaiah, speaking of the suffering servant in Isaiah 53, the suffering of our Lord Jesus Christ, says this, But he was pierced for our transgressions, he was crushed for our iniquities. Upon him was the chastisement that brought us peace, and by his wounds we are healed. What a beautiful message of the gospel, that he took upon himself our transgressions and our iniquities, and through his suffering we are healed. Let us then sing together the power of the cross as a response to this work of redemption.
Our message today for this Good Friday service will come from Matthew chapter 26. We'll be reading from Matthew chapter 26, verses 36 through 46. This is the passage in the Gospel of Matthew that recounts for us the prayer Jesus prays in the Garden of Gethsemane, right before going to the cross. Then Jesus went with them to a place called Gethsemane, And he said to his disciples, sit here while I go over there and pray. And taking with him Peter and the two sons of Zebedee, he began to be sorrowful and troubled. Then he said to them, my soul is very sorrowful, even to death. Remain here and watch with me. And going a little further, he fell on his face and prayed, saying, my father, if it be possible, let this cup pass from me. Nevertheless, not as I will, but as you will. And he came to the disciples and found them sleeping. And he said to Peter, Could you not watch with me one hour? Watch and pray that you may not enter into temptation. The spirit is indeed willing, but the flesh is weak. Again, for the second time, he went away and prayed, My father, if this cannot pass unless I drink it, your will be done. And again he came and found them sleeping, for their eyes were heavy. So leaving them again, he went away and prayed for the third time, saying the words again. Then he came to the disciples and said to them, Sleep and take your rest later on. The hour is at hand, and the Son of Man is betrayed into the hands of sinners. Rise, let us be going. See, my betrayer is at hand. May God add his blessing to the reading of his holy word. Let's pray. Father, we ask for your grace at this time through the power of your Spirit that we might hear your Word and understand it and that your Word might change us and transform us. We pray that in the name of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. Good Friday is a time to reflect upon the death of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. 
A Good Friday service is a sober reminder of the death he died for us and how we should live now, living in light of his death and in light of his resurrection. Death, especially in regard to our current experience with this coronavirus and the social distancing we're going through and and some of the loss we've experienced, death has become ever-present for us in a way that it was not a few months ago. It has brought fear and concern, some paranoia, and yet the truth of the matter is that death is always ever-present. We live in a fragile world. Our lives are held together by, by the very power of God, and so we deceive ourselves when we think that death is not ever-present. We just tend to ignore it. So during this time of this crisis, let's not waste it when God is pressing upon us this space in our spiritual journey, this experience that draws us close and face-to-face with the issue of death. Don't ignore it. Don't ignore what's happening. Don't ignore what God is allowing us to wrestle with because through that struggle, through that honesty, through that emotional turmoil, your faith can grow if you don't withdraw. And as we reflect on our Lord's death, I want us to consider how his death is unlike any other death. We see this in the story of the Garden of Gethsemane, the story of Jesus' final hours included in this section involve sorrow and distress. And then as he goes to the cross, he cries out, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Jesus' death is not like some of the stories we often tell in our Christian history or even our secular Western history. His death is not like those kind of stories, like, for example, Socrates, who faces death with a sense of emotional calm, or the stories of martyrs in the church like Polycarp, who said at his death, the fire you threaten burns but an hour and is quenched after a little while. You do not know the fire of coming judgment, but why do you delay? Come, do what you will. No, the death of Jesus is not like those stories. The death of Jesus is not like those deaths. Notice what's happening with Jesus. The gospel writers describe Jesus this way. He takes Peter and James and John, and he is greatly distressed and troubled, the gospel of Mark says. Jesus says to them, my soul is very sorrowful. Deeply distressed means literally astonished. His soul is astonished, and troubled means overcome with horror. Jesus' soul is astonished at the horror that he is about to face. This, being, this type of emotional experience of being overcome with horror is the type of feeling you get when bad news hits you and you feel sick, that you feel nauseous. That's what Jesus is experiencing at Gethsemane. He is so overcome with this situation that he prays that God would remove this cup from him. Matthew 26, 39, and going a little further, he fell on his face and prayed, Father, if it be possible, let this cup pass from me. Nevertheless, not as I will, but as you will. Jesus is experiencing something. He's seeing something. He's facing something that no one else in the history of the world has faced in this event of death. And as he sees it, he's asking God to remove it if there's another way. And the language he's using is the language of a cup. A cup that he must drink. We see this in verse 39. Let this cup pass from me. And then again in verse 42. If this cannot pass unless I drink it, then your will be done. And then there's even a third moment where the, Matthew says in verse 44 that Jesus went away and prayed for a third time saying the same words. If this cannot pass unless I drink it, let your will be done. The gospel writers are bearing witness 
to this cup Jesus had to drink. So what is it that is causing his soul horror, that is causing his soul distress, that is causing his soul the pain and suffering that he has seen? So much so, uh, one of the gospel writers describes him sweating drops of blood. The, The pressure is so intense. Well, in the Bible, the image of a cup is used three ways, three primary ways. The first way is just a a literal cup. The cup that Joseph hid in his brother's bags. A cup that someone picks up and drinks from. That's the literal meaning of a cup in the Scripture. And you take that literal meaning, and then you apply it to two symbolic ways of using a cup. One symbolic way is the cup of blessing. In the scripture, a cup is used to describe the cup of blessing that comes from the Lord. Psalm 23 is an example of this. My cup runneth over, as goodness and mercy follow me all the days of my life. The blessing of God in our life, for Psalm 16, the Lord is my cup and my portion. That is a description of the cup of blessing. Now, in Jesus' case, in the Garden of Gethsemane, neither the literal cup nor the symbolic cup of blessing fit. Jesus is not talking about grabbing a literal cup. He's clearly symbolically using the term cup. But it's not a cup of blessing. The other way that a cup is used in Scripture in this way is a symbol of judgment. In the Bible... The scriptures use the notion of a cup as a symbol of judgment many times. There are at least 15 primary passages in the Old Testament that speak of the cup of of God's wrath. The cup is a symbolic notion of God's hatred of sin, pointing to the fact that he will punish sin and judgment. Let me give you a few examples of these passages. Psalm 75, verses 7 and 8 says this, But it is God who executes judgment, putting down one and lifting up another. For in the hand of the Lord there is a cup of foaming wine, well mixed, and he pours out from it, and all the wicked of the earth shall drain it down to the dregs. That symbol in Psalm 75 is a symbol of the cup of judgment, a cup of of wrath. That cup is reserved for the wicked. Or listen again to Isaiah 51, just a few passages before that well-known suffering servant passage in Isaiah 53. Isaiah 51, 17 says, wake yourself, wake yourself, stand up, O Jerusalem, you who have drunk from the hand of the Lord the cup of his wrath, who have drunk to the dregs the bowl, the cup of staggering. There is none to guide you now. There is none to take your hand. These two things have happened to you. Who will console you? Devastation and destruction, famine and sword. Who will comfort you? Your sons have fainted. They lie at the head of every street like an antelope in the net. They are full of the wrath of God, the rebuke of your God. I could go through any number of other passages highlighting that In the Old Testament, especially with the prophets, the cup of God usually symbolizes the cup of God's wrath. Jeremiah and Ezekiel both point to this same image that Isaiah uses. That is the Old Testament background for this. And it brings us back to Jesus. That is the background for what happens in Gethsemane. When Jesus comes to this time, to this hour of the cross, when he comes to experience the suffering and the pain and the anguish, he knows what's coming. He knows what he has to go through. And so as he goes to the Garden of Gethsemane to pray, these Old Testament images, and there are many more from what I could have read, when the prophets come to Israel... To Jerusalem and bring a message of judgment, a message we often don't want to hear. When they come to bring a message of judgment, usually it is coupled with this notion 
that when God judges you, he's going to pour out his cup of wrath. And so Jesus, as he comes to this hour, he knows that God's wrath is bound up in this symbolic cup of judgment. And in the Old Testament, these are the moments of some of the strongest languages of judgment and anger and wrath. And this anger and wrath is what Jesus is receiving on the cross. Jesus, the only perfect person who has ever lived, the only person who has ever lived who perfectly obeyed his Father. You know, sometimes we pray that the Lord will forgive us for what we have done and what we have left undone. We pray that God would forgive us not only for the sins we commit, but the times when we don't love others properly. You have not only the sins that are aggressive acts of sin, but the sins we often call our sins of omission, where we neglect to love the Lord our God with all our heart, soul, mind, and strength. Well, our Lord Jesus never failed either one of those points. Not only did he never sin, but he also perfectly loved God and neighbor in the course of his life. And so Jesus, the only one who ever lived, who faithfully loved God and neighbor, is the one who prays in Gethsemane as he's going to the cross that God might let this cup pass because this is the wrath the Father is about to pour out on him. This is precisely why Jesus' death is different. This is precisely why his death is unlike any other death. This is precisely why the cup he's going to drink is a cup unlike other cups. Luke's gospel says that Jesus sweat great drops of blood because of the intensity of this moment. And it's not just because Jesus is afraid of death. It goes much deeper. He is going to take our sins. And in taking our sins upon himself and being punished in our place, the cup that we were supposed to drink, the cup of vengeance and wrath that we were supposed to take, he takes. While he is on that cross, as this cup is being poured out on him, this is precisely why he cries, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Jesus is sensing for the first time this isolation and abandonment and God's refusal to answer his prayer. Just consider, Jesus had prayed, God, let this pass from me, but if it can't, let your will be done. His Father is refusing to answer the prayer that the cup would pass. Listen to the words again. My soul is very sorrowful, even to death. He falls on his face and says, My Father, if it be possible, let this cup pass from me. My Father, if this cannot pass unless I drink it. And then a third time, if this cannot pass unless I drink it. And each time, the prayer that he asks for the cup to pass is followed by, Nevertheless, may your will be done. This is the cup he drank. And that prayer he prays at the Garden of Gethsemane is one of the most difficult prayers to pray in our life. In this time of confusion and fear, we pray as we go about and do things, we pray, Lord, please watch over us and protect us. Please, Lord, let this work out in a way that keeps us safe. And those are appropriate prayers. But it's difficult to follow that up with, nevertheless, may your will be done. And yet that is the prayer that Jesus prays that we have to follow. This cup that he drank, the cup of wrath, the cup of abandonment, this cup of pain and judgment, this cup that he took, he drank it all and emptied it. He emptied God's wrath until it was gone. That's the meaning in, the, in, in Romans when Paul talks about propitiation and some of the language of Christ as a substitutionary atonement. 
The notion is that God poured out his wrath on Jesus until it was exhausted and gone and the cup was emptied and there is no more wrath left. Jesus took it all. And this experience is what makes his death different. This experience is one of the most holy moments in history. As he emptied that cup of wrath, he did it so that he could turn to you and hand you not a cup of wrath, but a cup of blessing. It's what the disciples did not understand on that Good Friday when everything was dark, when everything was painful, when everything was difficult. They would not understand this till Easter Sunday, and we're getting ahead of ourselves by pointing uh, off to that day. But it's on Easter when, when, they start, when it starts to dawn on them that Jesus exhausted the wrath of God and now he has turned around and handed to them the cup of blessing that is most deeply symbolized in the Lord's Supper as we share it together. The cup that we take is the cup of blessing at that time. And so on Easter morning, the Lord Jesus will hand us the cup of blessing in the hope of the resurrection. But we're not at Easter yet. This Good Friday, we linger and wrestle with his death. And we wrestle with the fact that on that day, the abandonment that he felt was more than anyone had ever felt in history. The cup of wrath that he drank was more than anyone had ever drank. And those disciples had to wrestle with that for the next few days on Holy Saturday and then Easter Sunday as they are trying to piece together what happened. And even, even for the weeks ahead, as he teaches them, it falls into place, the depth of the suffering that he went through, the depth of the pain and the sorrow that Gethsemane describes. That's what Jesus did for you on Good Friday. And so as we are isolating ourselves at this time wisely, practicing social distance, being cautious about what we do. Do not let your actions and your work be out of fear because the Lord Jesus Christ has conquered death and drained the cup of wrath. But let it be out of the hope that you have in the gospel for him. Let's pray. Father, we would ask that at this time you would take what we've seen in in this passage about the Garden of Gethsemane and and the prayers of our Lord Jesus and the suffering that he went through, and that you would take this and use it to strengthen our faith. Lord, we all go through these feelings of abandonment and pain and loss, and we are thankful that we have the message of the gospel to strengthen and encourage us through this time. We would ask, Lord, as we reflect upon this Good Friday, that you would allow us to linger in our meditation of it, in our reflection of it, and not rush too quickly to the, to the hope that we know gets realized on that Sunday morning, but that we would linger wrestling with this death that our Lord died and the experience of the disciples as they were disillusioned and disoriented and confused and their world was turned upside down. In that experience, even in our own experience that we're struggling with, Lord, we pray that you would use it to draw us close to you. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. In concluding our Good Friday service, we're going to conclude with the words from John chapter 19. This is the conclusion of the readings that we read earlier in the service. John chapter 19, verses 38 through 42, instead of having a benediction and wishing you peace and grace as you leave, we're going to conclude with a simple reading of verses 38 through 42 as they bury our Lord. And as I conclude that reading, we will end the service. And I would ask, as you're sitting there and hear this reading, that you pause for just, you know, decide, five seconds, ten seconds, a little while, as you silently reflect upon what it would have been like to watch Jesus' body be buried on that day. After these things, Joseph of Arimathea, who was a disciple of Jesus, but secretly for fear of the Jews, 
asked Pilate that he might take away the body of Jesus. And Pilate gave him permission. So he came and took away his body. Nicodemus also, who earlier had come to Jesus by night, came bringing a mixture of myrrh and aloes, about 75 pounds in weight. So they took the body of Jesus and bound it in linen cloths with spices, as is the burial custom of the Jews. Now in the place where he was crucified, there was a garden, and in the garden a new tomb, in which no one had yet been laid. So because of the Jewish day of preparation, since the tomb was close at hand, they laid Jesus there. 